and gentlemen, this is your stewardess speaking. We regret any inconvenience the sudden cabin movement might have caused. This is due to periodic air pockets we encountered. There's no reason to become alarmed, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your flight. By the way, is there anyone on board who knows how to fly a plane? That vintage comedy scene captured a theme that's dominated public life ever since Northern Rock. Northern Rock is carrying on business in the normal way, and it can do that because we have a stable banking system. From the moment the run on Northern Rock started, one thing was clear. The authorities had lost the trust of the public. If they're not in trouble, why are they having to borrow from the government? Nobody's given an absolute guarantee that the money is safe in this bank. As the crisis went from bad to worse through the next year and beyond, there was every reason to question the ability of the authorities to handle things. But the seed of a second important form of distrust emerged too. The public bailed out the banks, while many bankers kept their silly remuneration. Fred Goodwin's pension was the best example. So Fred should not be counting on being £650,000 a year better off as a result of this, because it's not going to happen. Well, he did give some back, but kept hundreds of thousands a year and a few million quid on top. It was explained that by the rules that had made commercial Britain and the city the success that it was, you couldn't take away the whole of Fred Goodwin's pension once it had been promised to him. Now tell that to the workers of Britain who were witnessing a bonfire of their own final salary pension schemes at about the same time. Ah, that was different, it was explained. Those were informal promises that were broken. You're allowed to break those. Sir Fred, though, had formal contractual undertakings. I think to the public, stripping Sir Fred of his knighthood rather than taking away his pension didn't quite seem the same. It became impossible for the public not to spot a pattern, especially when the MP's expenses scandal came along. Who claimed for the fitting of two tiled cartons? Cartoons. cartoons. Oh, two cartoons yes. to their bathroom. Was it Liam Byrne, Lambert Opec, or Ken Clark? Lambert Opec. What's Any ideas, Ken? I've got two tile cartoons in my <laughs> bathroom in my second home. Did they, uh, that, when I uh, had somebody in, did he do oh. that for me? He put it on the bill, did he? The frame through which to view expenses had already been constructed by the financial crisis. People at the top on the take. The public, perhaps unsurprisingly, began to think everybody, rich or powerful, is in it for themselves. For a full decade before the crisis, it had become clear that London was pulling away from the rest of the country. Post-crisis, half the cranes in the country were in London, we were told. The city was doing fine. Oh, and the Olympics was helping nicely, thank you. A celebrated global multicultural hub. Everyone loved the Olympic Games, but was there a subliminal effect on the national psyche? Away from the hotspots of London and a handful of other big cities, there was, of course, a post-industrial Britain, in the outskirts of the big cities, in secondary cities and northern towns. And the fact that the crisis didn't inject a new sense of economic purpose in these places, there was no new economic model on the table, no investment surge. All that can only have increased resentment. The gap between London and the rest of the country may have been tolerated when it was working for everybody, but not anymore. It became possible to discern a new national divide, London and the big cities versus the rest. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm Nigel. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Sir. You got the UK. Good lad. <laughs> this is the man who talks sense. No surprise that against that backdrop, political outsiders could flourish. There was not just no trust in the old politics, there was suspicion that it was positively self-serving. And 
the populist forces were most powerful outside London and the big cities. I was never even intending to run for local council, uh, but it just seemed to me there was something going so badly wrong with our entire political class. The populist right could flourish with its anti-elite message. The populist left could flourish with its anti-elite message. Labour's John McDonnell was caught saying the left had predicted the financial crisis all along. I'm, look, I'm straight, I'm honest with you, I'm a Marxist. You know, I've been, this is a classic mark crisis of the economy, a classic capitalist crisis. I've been waiting for this for a generation. <laughs> and no prize for guessing which piece of the political spectrum suffered most. The one that was on watch when the financial crisis hit, the political centre. It was clear during the Labour leadership election that the centrists were struggling to channel the anger that so many people were feeling. I want all our children to have the best chance in life and I want everyone who shares our values to create a fairer, stronger, less divided Britain to feel that your home is with Labour. And the rest is history. The centre ground in politics struggling to keep up with volatile public opinion. A public more willing to entertain radical ideas than ever before, whether that's Brexit, Scottish independence or Jeremy Corbyn. Voting for Brexit against the wishes of London and the old political establishment. Can you trace all of that back to Northern Rock? Yes, I think you can. The only surprise is that the revolution has been so mild. The crash was a global phenomenon. The pattern of disruption in this country was evident elsewhere. And everywhere, it took its time to have an effect. But the crash was never just an ordinary bad recession. It was a shock to the core of the system.